65 years ago, audiences were dazzled at the first sight of Gone with the Wind in glorious Technicolor. But while this extraordinary movie was spectacular in many ways, it never looked and sounded as good as it does now. Join us as we go inside Warner's state-of-the-art restoration facility to see firsthand how an innovative studio goes about restoring a legend. It was the first true full-color motion picture image that anyone had ever seen before. These images look spectacular. What's been sitting on these natives all these years is just remarkable. When you look at our restored films of Adventures of Robin Hood, Gone with the Wind, Singing in the Rain, or Meet Me in St. Louis, all of these films today, when they're re-registered and realigned, they look far superior than any color motion picture shot in the first 10 or 15 years of color photography. I mean, on through into the 1960s. This company, Technicolor, developed a, this camera, and it actually ran three strips of black and white film in perfect registration simultaneously through the camera. One scene entered the lens of the camera, then got sp split through a prism, and that image then was recorded on these three individual strips of film. So each one of the black and white strips of film, while it was a, a gray and black and white image, it was a record of the red, green, and blue information. Sounds a little complicated, but what was great was Technicolor was able to interpret that information and then in turn transfer that into what was called a dye transfer printing process and they could create the full color image on the screen. Technicolor had a, an incredible color library and, and, and researched colors and dyes and they had probably the best knowledge of color in all its aspects uh, of anyone at the time and they came up with some very permanent dyes. So when you can find a Technicolor print from the era, from 1938, 1939, 1940, if you can find that print today, it may have scratches and damage to it from running through projectors, but the colors will be true. People will be happy for the rest of time that Gone with the Wind was recorded on a Technicolor camera. Older film in general, but Technicolor film specifically has um, some characteristic kinds of problems. As moisture extrudes out of the film over time, it causes the frames to distort and change shape. So you little ha literally will have, if you hold up a frame, instead of being a square, it's now kind of a trapezoid and it's a warp. Uh, luckily, our technology was able to compensate for that shrinkage. Otherwise, you would have seen areas like uh, there's a shuttered sequence when Melly is giving birth, and those shutters just went wild because of the shrinkage of the film. And these are normal things. Is, the film is an organic substance. It's going to shrink, it's going to warp, it's going to deteriorate, it's going to mold. And, and luckily, we can apply new technologies so that we can fight um, the ravages of time. Elements were not always well taken care of or well tracked throughout the decades. A wide range of bad ideas got in the way of hanging on to original things. Unfortunately, every this film was reissued on a number of occasions, and each time everybody attempted to modernize it a little bit. When people were working on these, these films, uh, especially Gone with the Wind and other titles as well, in the 1960s for re-releases, it ne never occurred to them that the actions they were taking, like reformatting compositions of dissolves and then tossing away the original elements of the process, it never occurred to them that they were damaging them from future generations of ever appreciating them again. Our primary audio source for the finished mono mix happened to be an element that uh, some very bright executive decades ago instructed the MGM vault to dispose of. A gentleman who we've worked with for years uh, was, an, was a music editor for MGM at the time, and he was working in the vault, and he's like, this shouldn't be thrown away. This is way too valuable. So instead of arguing with them to keep it, he simply hid it. He disguised it and stuck it away in a corner somewhere. And kind of made sure he knew where it was and followed it around off the radar for decades. And uh, this became our primary source. People today are much more sensitive to being faithful to the original motion picture than people have been in the past. I mean, it just there just was not that much respect or concern, nor did the people think that these elements in, with each succeeding year to think that these films necessarily had a life in the future. The problem was Warner Brothers has this huge library of three strip color motion pictures dating all the, from the 30s through the 1950s. So that it was felt that if we just re-release these films in the best photochemical restorations available, audiences wouldn't find them that, that attractive. 
So a gentleman at Warner Brothers came up with an idea, Chris Cookson, of using the process called edge detection. How about if we scan these three Technicolor negatives and through using edge detection, came up with how to realign the three records to a level of perfection never realized before. What happened was uh, we were in this theater when it was brand new and we were projecting the high definition version of it electronically on the screen. And he walked up to the screen and with a digital projector he could actually count that there was a, a five pixel error uh, as they held a still frame, a five pixel error of the red record on, on I think it was a horse or, or some object in the frame. So the the realization was that if we could just get these things to align, we'd find detail and information that's always been there but never visible. The task of writing the software was assigned to Paul Klamer of Warner Brothers, and Paul ended up working closely with Sharon and Karen Perlmutter of America Online, and they ended up writing the truly complex parts of the code. How the software works is, is we take the three Technicolor original camera negatives and we scan them on a 4K digital scanner. And then the software, we join those three records together, and that's when it goes through the process of actually detecting the red, green, and blue separations and how to realign them again. It's a remarkable software because it does this automatically. It literally takes each individual frame, and it starts at the center of the image, working its way outward until it gets to the outward edges of the frame and gets everything in perfect alignment again. Now, not only is it aligned at least as good as the film when it was originally released, we believe actually we've achieved a level of alignment and registration that probably has never been seen before. The result is, is actually beyond what we had hoped to see. We saw a degree of detail that we didn't even know to expect. A great example of the details that are revealed is that great opening shot of Scarlett O'Hara when she's first revealed in the picture. Whoa, whoa, whoa. This war talk's spoiling all the fun at every party this spring. I get so bored I could scream. You look at the, the, the lace detail on her dress. Uh, in previous film prints, you could see a texture of detail. But now, with this restoration, the clarity of the image, you can see that it is actually a precise lace pattern, and you can make out all of the threads in the lace. It's really spectacular to see, see these, these things that we're uncovering. And there's a, a scene where uh, Scarlett has a, a, a green velvet uh, shawl and, and uh, waistband. Oh, you look good enough to eat. In the previous versions, it was green and it was cloth and that was it but in the new version you look at it and it is so clearly velvet you can reach out and touch it it just uh, captures the sheen and the surface that was there the day they shot it if anybody out there has seen the dvd of singing in the rain or the adventures of robin hood there's undoubtedly a clarity in this new process the most important thing when we're working with these films is trying to find a most comprehensive inventory of, of the feature worldwide. There's a lot of material out there. So the first thing we do is we gather up everything we can find to evaluate it firsthand, to look at it and see what we've got. Look at it, check out its physical condition, and then listen to it and see what it sounds like. And God is my witness, I'll never be hungry again. These restorations are quite difficult, but some are easier than others depending upon how the, the materials were stored and how they were processed uh, originally. It's quite often times that we'll mix and match elements to make a successful completed restoration, and the key is making sure they match seamlessly and trying every trick in the book, and now we have a whole new bag of electronic tools to apply to this. What we're trying to do is be as faithful as possible to, to the original release of these motion pictures, using where we can uh, Technicolor dye transfer prints that exist from that era, so we know how the filmmakers originally color corrected the film, achieved the level of saturation and contrast. On Gone with the Wind or, or any release of that era, actually, when you, you get a Technicolor dye matrix print, you can't just automatically assume that those colors are accurate. Back then, the labs didn't throw away their bad prints. They'd go to the smaller markets, and they sent all the better quality prints to the major markets, New York, Chicago, San Francisco, Los Angeles. And so, since dye transfer prints never fade, you have an ugly print that gets found in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and people think, oh my god, it's a dye transfer print. This must be how the film was supposed to look. No, it's a print. It's not necessarily the print. And we have to kind of make a, a discrimination, a choice about what we think is the closest, what, what is in the best shape, what's survived the best. We were fortunate enough to get a 1939 color reference print that was used at Technicolor at the time of manufacture. 
was a real boon to us because it gave us a legitimate snapshot of what this film actually uh, looked like on its release. We had started into our restoration and we had to go back and rethink and rework uh, our work to date after we found that, but it was a great save for us. The most important thing in the color correction process when I'm referencing the old print is accuracy, the feel of the way it looks, the saturation of the color, the hue of the color. Because one thing with these Technicolor negatives is they achieve a level of purity of luminance in the color channel of red, green, and blue that you can never achieve with color negative. So if you're not careful, you can go way too far with the saturation on these movies. We're actually reining ourselves in. We're not even going as far as we're capable of because we're using these reference prints to try to match the entire look. You do have to rethink your colors, and you have to rethink your colors when you're doing a restoration uh, modern day because you're using different stocks, you're using different technologies, and you have to adapt your technology to make it uh, an accurate representation of what the original 1939 look was. This process is in some ways is subtractive rather than additive. Video shows you so much. It shows you so much of the color and the color interacts so much and the way it actually looks on film, you have to kind of rein that in sometimes. You have to make it a little more subdued. It's not uncommon in this film, which is very challenging, to have probably about eight to 12 color corrections in one particular shot just to make it look cohesive. Most people don't understand it, even with motion pictures today from Harry Potter to, to Troy, is, is that every, every shot when you see a movie actually has been carefully color corrected and balanced so that it's an even looking balance of color, brightness, uh, and density as you view it in the theater. Uh, and that, that went on in 1938, it goes on in 2004. After we've completed our color correction, we'll start tackling damage inherent in the original camera, negative dirt and dust or debris that have accumulated over the years. Great care is taken in the preparation of the elements, whatever that is, repairing, cleaning, getting them as, as pretty as we can make them. It's hard work. It takes a person sitting at a bench, going through the element a foot at a time, and evaluating broken perforations in the film need to be repaired. There's all kinds of physical repair that has to happen first. We spent an incredible amount of time actually going hand in hand and painting from the subsequent frame or literally painting um, scratches or, or negative tears away. You can have a, a scene where um, uh, an actress is turning her head and there's a specular highlight, a little glint on her eye, just on one frame. Well, often the automated software will interpret that little one frame glint as a piece of dirt and will remove that nice specular highlight off her eye. And obviously you don't want to lose that. So it does take a lot of uh, human intervention here to make sure it's done properly. As we get more experience with the technologies of uh, dirt and scratch removal and certainly the realignment software that we, we've come up with, you know, uh, Singing of the Rain took what, almost a year to yeah, do. Uh, Robin Hood was six months. Uh, Meet Me in St. Louis became a shorter time frame. So as we get more experience with it, it becomes easier and easier. We're able to unlock what was there originally. You can take something that's always been beautiful, that's been kind of covered up and maybe smothered a little bit by time and limitations in the format, and we can brush off the, uh, the unfortunate stuff and, and uncover what's in there. We're still trying to end up with a track that sounds like the original of Gone With The Wind, but we do reveal more information in the tracks. In other words, you can hear the rustle of dresses that you could not hear before in the composite track. You can hear percussion instruments in the scoring. The challenge in creating stereo for an old movie like this is to Make it convincing, because in creating stereo, it shouldn't be to, wow, what was that? It should be supporting the picture, supporting the story. When Rhett and Scarlett are trying on her new hat that he's brought her from Paris, in a scene like that, there's going to be almost no difference between a 5-1 stereo and a mono. They're in a room talking, and there's nothing you can do with a scene like that except make it play as natural as possible. Alternately, when Atlanta is being evacuated as the Yanks are approaching and they're shelling Atlanta, there's a lot of opportunity there. There are bombs going off all over the place, some on camera, some off camera. And it supports the picture and the story, but again, not to the point hopefully where it's noticed. It should never take you out of the story. The consumer of the DVD is really getting a huge uh, quality leap in, in terms of the audio tracks. And now you've got five discrete channels of audio information that are basically digital copies direct from the master tapes. It's amazing quality leaps. 
the reproduction in the theaters in the 1930s was very narrow. Um, I have filters that emulate it, and when you compare, it's like going from uh, high-resolution stereo to AM radio. Uh, so there was always a lot more information in the original recorded tracks, high frequencies and low frequencies, uh, than was ever heard in the original presentation. We like to view digital technologies as empowering us to mine the information that's been sitting on these film and audio elements that's been sitting there all these years for us to discover. We aren't doing any digital enhancement or digital image creation to uh, create something that there that wasn't there previously. We are not allowed to sweeten or add extra things. We are bound by Warner Brothers to only use original elements. We never try to augment somebody's work. What we try to do is um, um, basically replicate what we have in its purest form. And we're trying to replicate the theatrical look of the film. So what we try to do is use uh, uh, period references and sources print-wise to capture the intended projected look so it looks like we were in the theater at the time. But we're taking these films that have been basically degrading over the decades. People haven't been seeing the versions that people saw 65 years ago. In fact, people think these films are grainy, or they think that they always were grainy. The truth is, when people saw these films in 1938, 1939, 1945, they weren't that grainy. They're actually quite pleasing. The Technicolor process itself was kind of a, a grain-hiding process. The ability to, to really restore the image back to what was originally filmed is something that is, is, is very powerful today and which really has only been available in, in a lesser form in years past. And so what we're trying to do is we're trying to take these tools really to their limit to find out what they can do to give us the power to get what's really on the negative up onto the screen. Someday I want you to say to me the words I heard you say to Ashley Wills. I love you. There's nothing between you and seeing the absolute best quality that we show the filmmaker. It's stunning what they can achieve with the picture now. And it sure is a happy day. These motion pictures have almost infinite life. There's always new audiences to appreciate and enjoy these pictures. People can see these films in a way that they've never been seen before. I hope that people continue to love these movies the way I love these movies.